And the award for the best TF Nation yet goes to TF Nation 2023. It was this year. This year was really good. I had a good time. <laughs> great guests, great panels, great toys, uh, and most of all, great company. Uh, I've sort of blacked out for two weeks since the convention, um, but I'm back and I figure uh, we can basically just go over the entire weekend to the best of my recollection uh, and just see see what happened, commit it to memory, go on record about it, um, and then I'll be able to refer back to this in, in future years and go, oh yeah, that happened, I guess. So one thing that was great about this year for me was that I got all of my like horrible mishaps out of the way before I arrived there. Like once I got there, it was fine, uh, but on the way I was quite stressed. M the main thing was that uh, I really wanted to have a new mini comic for this year's event uh, before going along, uh, but being honest, uh, when I made the last one, <laughs> I was very unemployed, uh, and turns out that not being unemployed uh, is actually makes it quite difficult to make a comic, who the funk. So on Thursday, uh, before leaving, this was like the first moment I'd had to like sit down and try and print out some more copies, uh, and my Byzantine hell printer just simply was not having it. Like, I've tried a bunch of different stuff, uh, and no matter what settings I used, uh, it just came out looking horrible. I ended up with like three differently terrible copies of the comic uh, before the printer just decided to crap out entirely and say, actually, those ink cartridges, they don't exist. Luckily, I still had some leftover ones from the Minicom back in Manchester, uh, so I just brought those along, and as it happened, it was kind of the perfect amount. Like, I, I didn't have, like, tons to give away, but in terms of everyone I actually wanted to, like, go up to and give a specific comic to, or who'd asked for one, I ended up giving out all but one copy, which in my book is, is basically perfect. So yeah, next year I'm definitely gonna have to get them like professionally printed. Um, like even just on the way uh, through the NEC, I noticed there was a print shop uh, and I, I went in and I was like, oh, you know, I've got this thing. Can you can you print me some copies? Um, and the guy was really nice. He took like a, a huge interest in it, um, but he, he was like, you, you need to add bleed to the, to the file that you send us. Um, and I was like, I do not know how to add bleed to a file. <laughs> and aside from all that stuff, uh, my phone just ran out of charge uh, halfway on the train journey, uh, which would have been fine, but like my ticket is on my phone. I, I don't have any way of showing that otherwise. So uh, I had to go like sit around in a waiting room for, for like 15 minutes while I was waiting for a charge. I'm like, oh no. And also I tried like three different ATMs to try and get some cash out before getting there. Uh, and they just weren't reading my card. It's, it's been a consistent problem. And I've not got it fixed because it's, it's not like every ATM. There's some that do work. Uh, and sure enough, the one at the, the station uh, did eventually work. Um, and I was able to get some money out, but apparently the actual ATM in the Hilton uh, ran out of cash at like 10 a.m. on Saturday, uh, which is fucking mental. There was a lot more vendors this year that were like doing card payments, but like, yeah, it's still still very much you just need cash. Um, so plan ahead if you're going next year. But I feel like at this point, actually going into the NEC and making my way to the hills and everything, it just feels like second nature. Like having been so many times now it is just like coming home you know you, you know where everything is uh like i think that's the benefit of having the convention going back to the same venue year after year uh is that it's also like a location um it's not like just the people in the event itself and from basically the moment i stepped through this year uh i was just around people the whole weekend first off there was my good friend and annual roommate jala guy uh, he'd got us all checked in. Now, a couple of months ago, I'd given him a couple of these, like, Lego puzzle books that are, like, 20 years old that I'd found, like, basically new in a discount bookstore. Uh, and I was like, I don't want these, really, but I know who does. <laughs> and so as thanks, he gave me this little memory stick uh, with the despecialized editions of a couple of the Star Wars movies, um, because I do not know how to torrent. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's missing Return of the Jedi because uh, apparently when they say 64 gigabytes, they actually mean like 50 gigabytes, and that is, that is not enough space for free movies. So aside from Jala, there was prolific TF Wiki editor uh, and unofficial Aspect of Prime sequel writer uh, Locoman, who um, has come all the way over from Canada this year. Like, he's been mooching around for a week or so, you know, made, making it into a bit of a trip, uh, but he's really just flown over for the convention. And like, I've never met him. I have no idea what he looked like or what he sounds like. So, you know, very, very exciting uh, to actually meet him in person um, because we've been talking online for absolute ages now. But I wasn't expecting to see, and like, I, I think I did know, I, I think I just forgot, but I wasn't, I was very surprised uh, to see Daniel Adkins and Irini, like long time TF Wiki Discord users, 
Um, Daniel has now taken over from Loco Man on the um, Transformers comics write-ups now that Skybound is doing all the stuff. Um, so he's been doing all the Void Rivals pages. And he's also a writer on Aspect of Prime as well. Meanwhile, Iruni's probably the world's number one Beast Wars Uprising enjoyer uh, and just a general Discord gremlin. <laughs> Uh, and rounding out the squad this year is Jolene, um, who basically just does it all. Like, she helps keep the wiki running, she writes and edits for Aspect of Prime, uh, and she's my co-host on Our Worlds Are In Danger, um, the podcast where we travel back to the Transformers Armada, Micron Legend. Uh, this year I bought a little Disney Infinity Nova figurine um, for her, because we're both big fans of Jeff Lovness's run with the character. You should read it, it's, it's quite good. But yeah, basically, I think this was, like, the biggest showing of wiki heads uh, that we've yet had at TF Nation. Uh, and this is a problem, but more on that later. So, Friday is the panel-only day. Um, in the past, it's been kind of like a, a low-key affair as everyone's, like, streaming in. Uh, but over the last couple of years, they've sort of tried to make it into, like, its own day. You know, its own, like, day of the convention. Um, but you can't get into the dealer hall, you know, there's no, like, uh, guest signings at tables and stuff. It's just panels. And so this year, there was only a couple I wanted to see. First of all, uh, there was the History of Gunpla panel by Ari and Erica, um, because basically I've, just, I've always been vaguely interested to know what the actual first with Gundam is, um, and also just because they're funny as shit. And luckily the whole thing was recorded, um, so you can check it out on YouTube, I highly recommend it, it's quite good. A new panel I want to see was something of an encore for Andy Cousins, who's like um, a Hasbro designer who worked on all the sort of late G1 Europe exclusive stuff. But he wasn't able to make it this year. Um, I'm not sure we know why he had to drop out last minute. And so David Wallace and Chris McFeely like just basically went over his presentation apparently, um, and uh, his wife was there the next day, like doing running his stand basically. But yeah, I have no idea what went on in that panel. Um, for me, Friday was basically just chilling in the bar uh, and getting all of my optional side quests out of the way. I did like a sales post in Vangela Convention and a guy on Facebook uh, contacted me to say that he wanted my alternate universe Optimus Prime or Optimus Prime's corpse, or whatever the fuck. But he wasn't going to the convention. He wanted me to meet up with his friend, who was going, who lived nearby, and then we could do, like, a handoff. Um, and so, yeah, I had no idea who I was looking for, um, but Chris McFeely apparently did, uh, and he was like, oh, yeah, he's just over there. Uh, go say hi. And so, yeah, both of these gentlemen were, like, super nice. Honestly, just a perfect sales process in person. Because one of the nice things about, like, actually doing trading and stuff at a convention is that it's an excuse to actually just talk to someone new. You know, you have absolutely, you know, no reason to talk to otherwise. So, yeah, really cool. I'd also arranged to trade a couple of figures with Viv uh, at Toastergirl, um, who was attending TF Nation for the first time in literally years. Because obviously things are still, like, bouncing back from COVID. Um, and as it happened, you know, this year, a lot of people went home from the convention and were like, yep, shit. I got COVID, so um, yeah, definitely uh, valid concerns to be having. But to hear her say it, she was not going to miss this one for the world. And yeah, I was really glad to see her. Like we met back at my first TF Nation all the way back in 2018. Um, and so this is this was finally like the homecoming. Everyone's back kind of thing. As for the trade, uh, what I gave away was a Kingdom Core class Optimus Prime um, and a Siege Storm Cloud, which Viv wanted to um, make like a... A, a full sort of legacy star saber with you know whisper storm cloud storm cloud again uh, it's the vibe for the full free mini con experience not sure how that's panned out but i was i was nonetheless quite enthralled by the idea and in exchange i got a couple of bees check them out first of all we have this uh, reveal the shield gold bug um who's done this wonderful sparkly plastic <laughs> And this little Legion class universe mold is just one of the all time uh, best bumblebees, I would say. He's just so lovely. He transforms so easily. It feels like the yeah the early 2000s update of specifically that G1 toy where it's really straightforward um, and it has like so much character to it. And the other one was Frilling 30, Bumblebee and Blazemaster. Like with, with both of these, I've like had the mold before um, and that's kind of why I wanted them because they're both such good toys. Like I had the Cliff Jumper colors, which uh, as I found out this year, uh, Jala told me that it's inspired by Matt Tracker's car from Mask. What, why? <laughs> Sure, Joe Kide, I guess. She's a beekeeper. Gonna try to keep her. So yeah, he's very specifically based on the Andrew Griffith uh, version of the War for Cybertron movie mold. And he also has this little uh, Minicon Target Master partner, kind of in the vein of like Hot Shots Jolt, I guess. Uh, and he has this super rad transformation where the whole thing like accordions back on itself to turn into a little gun. 
the rotor detaches and then you can get Bumblebee up with like a little little saw blade kind of thing in this whole big blaster. So yeah, it's a really cool little set uh, and this toy has extra significance to me, I'll say, uh, which maybe you'll, you'll find out about at some point in the future. Or maybe not. You, you might just never know. Viv also traded me uh, a couple of spare comics that I didn't need for this uh, Nick Roche cover for More Than Meets the Eye issue 14, which is the one where uh, Chrome Dome and Overlord have the little tete a tete, as it were. I actually read my uh, original copy of this one on the way down to the convention. I was like, oh, oh no, More Than Meets the Eye is quite good, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, something great about Friday is that even though the dealer hall like hasn't opened yet, there's still like a fuck ton of toys just floating around the bar. Uh, and it's always like a game of like, ooh, what's over here? Who's got what? Jala had brought along the Smash Changer uh, Rise of the Beasts Optimus Primal, which is the one where you basically just go like, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, ka -chunk, on the on the desk and it like all flips out and around and turns into the robot. And Jala had bought this originally specifically because veteran G1 uh, toy designer Kojin Ono uh, had described it as a triumph of engineering. And having handled it, He's fucking right. That thing is that thing is right as hell. We all just like give that guy a good smack on the table, and for the moment you see him like flip around and transform, that's it. You're in love. It's it's wonderful. I'm trying to think. Yeah, I also got to handle uh, the Generations Warpath mole for the first time in the form of Botcon Striker, which Erica had. I was like, this is far too nice for me to be transforming, uh, and she was like, oh, I don't give a fuck. Just just do it. And I was like, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, and yeah, it deserves the hype. That's a really good figure. Um, I sadly did not see uh, a Warpath in the actual dealer hall, because if I had, I probably would have snapped it up. Conversely though, Joe had a animated uh, Samurai Prowl, which everyone says is a great toy, and that thing's dog shit. That thing is not good. Like, we're all just there, like, trying to transform it and, and figure it out and get it all, like, lined up right, and those legs just, they just don't want to peg in anyway, they just don't want to, like, cooperate. The hips have, like, a billion joints in them. Uh, so it's like, yeah, very, very poseable, very cool, but... Uh, not, not such a great transformer. Anyway, in terms of getting my errands done, uh, I was fairly quickly able to track down Ben Waspshot, uh, who had for me a copy of the Refined Robot Co. Zine 2023. So the first one was last year, and this was the sequel. Uh, you know, we're back, bigger, better, more stuff going on. This year I had a review in there of Kingdom Dracodon. Feel free to squint at that before the digital release of the zine comes out at some point. Normally I like to save these for reading on the trip home, but this year uh, my train was fucked. It was like there was cancellations, uh, everyone had piled onto mine, it was fucking sardines, uh, and so I did not have a chance to read this until like last week. Um, but it's incredibly cool. There's some, there's some really great artwork in here. Where else are you going to find a poem extolling the virtues of Universe Darkwing? Uh, nowhere is the answer. I ran into Paper Plane off the YouTubes. He's been helping me out occasionally over the last year with like lost media and stuff, uh, specifically the Titan magazine like movie tie-in comics, um, which we just don't have scans for. Like if you have a copy of those and you have a good enough scanner, please send us some scans because we could do with them. But I feel like I've never actually had the chance to chat with Paper Plane properly and I, I kind of still haven't, um, but he's very sound as it turns out. Someone in his little gang had found a promotional copy of a Robots in Disguise magazine, which they were like, yeah, is, is this lost media? And I'm like, uh, probably. So in my head I'm immediately thinking, okay, I know who needs to see this, because I think there's only one person in the world who act would actually care at all, um, and that is Stuart Webb, uh, Inflatable Dalek. This guy still was buying the Rescue Bots uh, magazine shovelware thing that gets put out every month or, or however often uh, with like, you know, screen cap comics from the cartoon. Um, what a soldier. Uh, there's kind of miscommunication with the whole thing, which I, I take full responsibility for. It was entirely my fault. And I basically go over and I'm like, hey, look, uh, they found this rare magazine that no one seems to know about. Um, and Stuart's like, oh, wow, thank you. That's that's great. That's very kind of you to, to give that to me. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Uh, I've, I realize now that the way I've, I've uh, phrased this whole thing makes it like they're just, they're just giving it to you when really they have no idea who the fuck you are. Um, so, whoops. Uh, but as it turned out, they were very happy to just let him have it because it is just a very a shitty uh, promotional magazine thing. And he's since now uh, compared it to the original uh, Robots in Disguise magazine, which it's, you know, uh, lifted from. And it turns out there's, there's very little different. They just changed the cover and, and some stuff. Uh, but still, a bit of an interesting oddity. Uh, it's nice to have it documented. So yeah, big shout out to RuZZ. I, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, the coming across this thing, very cool. So yeah, I wish I'd seen more of that lot over the weekend, uh, but that's one nice thing about TFN is there's always next year. 
case in point, last year I met Polish fan Silverfoil, who won a couple of things that I was giving away, I think. Uh, we didn't actually get to talk much at the time. Uh, this year, on Friday, we were actually able to sit down and properly, like, shoot the shit. He had a Beast Wars buzzclaw on his table, holding up, like, a little sign saying, Ask me about Beast Wars Uprising. Clearly aiming to challenge Iruni for the crown of number one Beast Wars Uprising enjoyer. But yeah, so he was very wigged out when Jim Sorensen uh, comes over and sits down and goes, so tell me about Beast Wars Uprising. But yeah, Silver Falls great. Uh, it was a really nice chat and has great taste in robots. Always exciting to see. Now, the would have been Andy Cusins panel was at kind of a weird time. It was at 7 p.m., which is basically when everyone wants to be like having tea. So because it turned out basically nobody had had lunch, we were like, okay, we'll just go for like an early dinner beforehand. And because so many people uh, had come over the pond this year to say hi, uh, we felt like it was only proper uh, that we show them the wonderful experience of a cheeky Nando's. For me, Nando's has like a really strong association with TFN because I do not eat there the rest of the year. It's just that it happens to be one of the chain restaurants they have at Resort World. Uh, and so we always end up going. And yeah, this, this year we were joined by Jim Sorensen and David Bishop, uh, which is always very exciting. And yeah, afterwards back in the bar, uh, Ben got us playing Lexicon, which is an old like letters card game, I guess. You're basically trying to spell words in front of you using the, the letters you have in your hand. It was a bit of a headache getting all of our heads around the rules, uh, mostly because Ben did not have his own head around the rules either. Um, but Jala did get to play the best word that you can play in any of these word games, so that's pretty good. Oh boy, Saturday. It's the big one. It's when you mostly shop in, it's Club Con, it's everything. After breakfast, we were back in the bar, naturally, um, and we found Silverfoil with, um, oh, let me Google this actually. A Jinbao KO Generation Toy Gravity Builder, or uh, a G2 Devastator, but you know, big, a big freak fucker. This guy was fucking big uh, and very wibbly, which is why uh, Silverfoil had brought him along to donate to Toy Fu. And with a bit of help from TFWiki Discord user Charstov, uh, we were actually able to combine this thing. And Jala even managed to get it into something resembling a cool pose without it exploding into a billion tiny little pieces. So I'd call that a win. And with that, it was queuing for the dealer hall. So there's really two ways to approach the dealer hall, I'd say. Um, for example, uh, Loco Man went in this year um, knowing that he wanted two things. He wanted Commander Class Armada Optus Prime, and he wanted the IW2 uh, Javelin Cascade 2-pack. And he was like, if I get those two things, I'm happy. So he bought the early access ticket to get into the dealer hall. He went in, he bought those two items, uh, he went out, and he was there at the bar playing with them, totally happy, just before the rest of us had even started queuing up for the regular access. That's, that's how you do it. That's like a fucking man on a mission right there. And the other approach, I would say, which is what I try, um, is that you go in and you, you just keep an eye out for stuff that you think is like a decent price. Like, just try not to spend more on anything than you would have spent if it was like new at the shop. Because obviously you find with certain characters or certain like rare toys or whatever that they command these like big prices because people want them and they, you know, they'll go for it. And obviously like I would also like to get those, but if you're on a budget, um, then you'll find that, that budget goes much further if you just keep an open mind and you just look out for, oh, hey, I, I want one of those and that's, you know, fairly cheap, I'll pick that up or whatever, rather than having, like, the very specific uh, list of, of loads and loads of things because it's the one event of the year where you're going to be able to see all the toys that you want. That said, this year I did allow myself the luxury of, like, putting together a little collage wish list of all the things I was looking out for, so memorize all that and then see in the rest of the video how well I did. So I'm definitely starting to get a sense of the specific vendors that come back year after year, um, so obviously you've got Toy Fu, which is the big flashy one with all the, you know, weird rare toys and stuff, um, all going to charity. It's got the big table right as you come in, um, and they are persistently swamped. Like you have like a, a row of people all along the front of the table, and then another row of people behind trying to get a look, and then maybe even more people behind. And honestly, similarly, you've got the big online, like new stuff vendors, uh, in demand and Kapow Toys. And they have basically anything that you're after that's just come out or, you know, from this year, they will have it boxed and all, all their stock with them. And then you've got the Space Bridge, which has mostly like, I would say bagged or like sealed older stuff. Um, and they just have, have absolutely tons of it. Um, they're sort of over the back of the room. And even with the actual like panel area having been moved into, you know, its own room, its own venue, um, and with the, the Forge having kind of moved in to fill that space with all the fan works and stuff, um, the dealer hall still feels kind of very cramped, I would say. I think definitely in the sort of next room they have, they could definitely put like Toy Fu over there, or they could put, um, you know, in demand and Kapow with the new stuff, because those are, those are sort of, um, 
the ones that get really like busy and draw a lot of space in the queue and then that way you can have more space for like the independent artists and for the other tables and honestly just more floor space for people to be walking around in um, because it's real cramped, <laughs> especially when COVID is still very much a thing at these conventions. For me, it's the smaller, like, independent sellers who have, they go, they go and they take out, like, a single table or two tables. Um, they're the ones who have the most interesting stuff, and they're the ones I spend most time, like, just rooting around, seeing what they got. So I think without further ado, let's get into the first item that I got. Kingdom Tigertron. Um, this guy is pretty cool. Um, he is just Cheetor, again, but bigger. So I got this guy from one of my favorite uh, returning stalls this year, Shins of the Wreckers. Um, they always just have like a lot of stuff at like pretty good prices. Um, in the case of this guy, uh, they had him pretty cheap on account of the fact that he's pretty yellowed. Um, this is a problem with basically all samples of this toy and honestly most toys that would be manufactured around a certain point. Um, I'm not even sure if they've quite fixed the problem yet. But from, from my perspective, I've basically just sort of resigned myself to the fact that certain toys are going to be like this. Um, and so getting one that's sort of pre-yellowed um, makes me feel okay because then I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about keeping it like out of the light or anything like this. It's happened, it's done. Um, and honestly, he doesn't look too bad. But yeah, so as boring as this guy kind of is, uh, it does mean that I'm now just three characters down for like that first season sort of maximal Predacon showcast, um, which is pretty exciting. They were also selling uh, Thrilling 30 Cosmos and Payload. Now, this guy has always like struck me from pictures as just being an incredible toy. Uh, and yeah, he absolutely is. Look, they combined together into a, a nothing. UFOlogy, yes, it's all real. Ancient aliens, it's all true. So this guy's just really fun. Uh, he's got a wonderful transformation. The figure looks great. Uh, and this is how he appeared in the pretty good um, Valentine's Day special strip, Open Comms, by Sarah Peter DeRocha. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Which is honestly one of the best Transformers comics uh, since the like IDW reboot. So yeah, very cool. Very happy to have this. After that, my other favorite uh, returning stall from last year, Blue Beetle. Um, they hooked me up with replacements for a bunch of stuff that I used to own. Um, so they had Reveal the Shield Cyclonus with Nightstick, um, like just an all-time great uh, toy. You know, it's the universe figure in the wonderful, like cartoon accurate colors. Your love is like a cyclone in a swamp and the weather's getting warm. My original one of these I lost when a suitcase of mine got stolen. I had like this guy, Scourge, Galvatron, um, and Henke Astro Train, uh, and I've sort of replaced them all one by one, uh, and this was the last one that I had to do. Uh, so I can finally put that behind me. Um, check him out, he's so small. They also had Revenge of the Fallen Breakdown, uh, who you'll, you'll notice I've transformed earlier. Um, the reason being is that the original one of these that I had um, snapped in half when I tried to transform it once. Um, the just hip joint in here, the entire thing is connected via a small little pin um, and the whole thing just snapped. On this one it's already fracturing so not ideal um, but hey now I have one in car mode, one in robot mode, uh, I guess that, that'll have to do. Finally they had possibly the most special thing that I got all weekend um, which is a pristine Beast Wars quick strike. Oh my god check this guy out. Um, like incredible colours um, like just an insane design and honestly just a really fun transformation all cowboys need to trust that this town might be big enough for both of us this guy is absolutely stunning my original copy of this i found at a car boot sale when i was very young uh, and it was my favorite toy and i lost it within like a year i want to say at a supermarket uh, and it's taken me this long to find a replacement you know it's just a case of seeing one for like the right price the right time um and so i could not be happier i was originally missing the beast mode head slash uh, quick strikes but um but uh, just have a complete copy of this um it's it feels so good so right it just takes me back to like watching beast wars reruns on the uh channel 5 like children's programming block milkshake um which is sort of yeah what gave me my love of beast wars i was like oh my god this is the best thing and all the toys were released before i was born so any one that i had was absolutely precious but yeah, I circled back to their store like a bunch of times over the weekend. Um, so just to keep it to the things I got on the first day, um, I also picked up a Titans Return cut, mostly just for the colors. I've always loved this guy and he also seems to have like a really interesting transformation as well. So pick up some of that bitch <laughs>
So yeah, this is specifically, apparently, Guido Guidi's design for the character from All Hail Megatron. Um, he just kind of doesn't look like it because of the colors they've applied. But he's just a perfectly designed figure. Um, like, the transformation, the, the way the legs collapse is just so clever and interesting. Next up, we got Real Gear Robots Zoom Out 25X. Uh, as you can see, he's got the little override uh, camera display in there from, from when this was presumably going to be in the Cybertron toy line at one point. Um, yeah, he's just so straightforward. He has a really cool little wing pack, um, and he was the last of the Real Gear Robot molds that I just never picked up. Um, so I basically now have a complete set of those first eight toys. In a very similar vein, but released like a decade later, um, it's Titan's Return Laser Beak. This guy was the last of Soundwave's tapes that I needed to get, um, and so now I have him. I've already owned this mold twice. I, I, I don't care for it. <laughs> oh yeah, and as a freebie for anyone who spent over a certain amount of their store, they were giving out like uh, just like they had like a, a lucky dip, I guess. Um, a lot of tiny turbo changers and bot bots in there, um, and so for me, I, I got to pick one out, um, and it was like, oh, it's Dragonstorm. This guy is so small, you're not gonna be able to see a thing. He's gonna be like a, just a, a gray greebly indistinct mess kind of like he was in the actual movie but yeah his transformation is simpler than i think i'm not going to time lapse this one boom look he's done uh, <laughs> but yeah he's quite neat he's quite good fun oh and they also had like a, a cup of cyber keys just random ones that they, they sort of got lost from their figures at certain points uh, and so i was able to pick out one that i was missing for a cybertron backstop that i got a car boot sale a long time ago so i was very pleased about that later on we were we were trying to find um one for my friend uh and we went back and he was like oh no they're all gone someone bought them all and it's like yeah that's that's fair cyber keys are yeah quite nice to have unfortunately this wasn't a great year for me for like just finding spare parts normally there's like I think the space bridge brings along like a big box, a big tub of, of bits, or maybe it's in demand. Um, and so normally I managed to like find a few things to complete various figures. Um, this time they did not bring anything along. So meh, I, I could not have a look. Um, hopefully next year, we'll see. But yeah, it's always great to talk to the Blue Beetle guys. Um, they always have just really weird stuff. Like later on the Sunday, one of them shows us like this really cool transforming watch thing that was like from Japan. Um, like it's a really chumby little robot who goes onto a strap and has like a digital watch face. And I've not been able to find pictures of it online to illustrate this, unfortunately. Um, apparently it's just a fairly rare, rare item. So he like had brought it along. He was like, oh, it's, it's worth money. So I will put a high price tag on it. And then when no one buys it, I will simply keep it and use it as a watch. And I was like, you know what, mate? Fucking fair. But yeah, at the Space Bridge, I was actually able to find a couple of books that I'd been after. Um, they had the Transformers Energon official guidebook, which, oh, I'm only just now noticing uh, it includes some G1 stickers. Uh, what? Sure? These look like they've been cut out of something else and stuck in here. Um, live sticker reaction. What is this? It's, it's the Dreamwave Minibots cover art. It's it's God Ginrai's packaging art. But yeah, the format of these is that they have like the sort of Dreamwave artwork, and they also have like photos of the toys. Um, so I have the Armada one, now I have the Energon one as well. And the sort of profile material in here is always just like a little bit different to actual, um, you know, canonical material as it were. So um, it'll be interesting to see if there's anything strange going on in this one. And the last book was Trial by Fire, one of the Titan books, like reprints of the Marvel comic. Um, so it's got all of Headmasters, uh, and a few more issues sort of when they cross back over with the main book. Um, this is just one of the ones that I was missing, um, and now I'm down to, I think, two volumes left to get, um, so that's quite exciting. This year I was really hoping to actually, like, complete my Dreamwave collection, like, last year they had pretty much all of it, just in random issues, big long boxes, and no one was buying it, uh, and so this year, uh, he did not bring them back, <laughs> um, but hopefully next year he will, and then I will be able to pick up the stuff that I'm missing. This is the thing, I don't want to buy Dreamwave books, but I, I have to due to my agonies. Anyway, let's take a quick break from toys. So we dipped into the May Cat panel, which was honestly super interesting. Uh, they're just really candid about like the entire process of working on Earthspark, and they dropped some very spicy tidbits about what Hasbro will and will not allow uh, to be done with their characters in a flagship cartoon. Um, so that was fun. 
And there was also the charity auction, which had loads of just really like random offbeat stuff being flogged. The big one that sticks out in my mind was this huge 3D printed Optimus Primal uh, sword, which Jim Sorensen was just swinging around like a maniac all weekend. The same guy had made like an incredible trans metal driver that like lit up and everything. Um, and he had like a Dinobot sword, which he used in his cosplay. Honestly, just incredibly cool stuff that people are making now with 3D printing. Um, it feels like it's just such an art form at this point. And after the auction, I actually managed to catch someone who'd reached out to me on Twitter looking for a, a copy of the Wheelie comic to give to his son. And his son turned out to be very shy, uh, but I'd also brought along uh, a Combiner Wars bombshell, which he wanted. Um, I, I had a spare one because it, its leg had sort of broken at one point kind of thing. It was like sort of flopping around. So yeah, I gave him those things. And it turned out that they'd won the sponsored Basics episode. Um, so they hadn't decided quite what they were gonna like request as the subject. Um, but I'm sure we'll find out like fairly shortly, I guess, when it gets made. So um, really exciting. Back in the dealer room, uh, Joe had picked up an Armada scavenger from Toy Fu, but unfortunately the tread had snapped on the arm, uh, and that's kind of that's kind of the main gimmick of, of Armada scavenger. But luckily, because Toy Fu are sound, uh, they just let it return it no problem, and I was able to find another complete uh, scavenger uh, that was fully intact from the space bridge, um, and so. Yeah, in incredibly cool toy. So yeah, all told, it was a very uh, scavenger-heavy convention <laughs> for Joe this year. Like, she'd got this incredible commission from Nick Roche of the character. I'm just gonna, like, put that up here. I've since coloured it up. Um, it's honestly just such a, a cool piece. While I was going around the dealer hall, I'd spotted uh, a Transformers Armada jigsaw puzzle, um, and I was like, oh, <laughs> that'll be a laugh to get for Joe. Uh, and then later on, uh, Joe comes up to me and she's like, hey, I've got something for you. Uh, and I'm like, Oh, <laughs> what what is it? And she just she just holds it up like, and I was just like, yeah, I was I was gonna get that for you like like half an hour ago. I I hesitated. And now now look, I'm paying the price. But yeah, it's sealed. It's it's not been touched since 2002. It's gonna be very exciting to put this together. Uh, I I guess I will then try and have to get a frame for it or something. <laughs> I noticed that Toy Fu had a Legends wheelie and go shooter um, with the box for what seemed to me like a steal. Um, so I was like, okay, sure, I'll, I guess I'll do a punt on that. Like, they said I rap like a robot, so call me rap. This guy's colors are just so, so great. Um, the little go shooter he came with, um, Siren, I guess, for um, English people. He has oddly no visor painted on. I have no idea what's going on with this guy. The, the paint works really sloppy in general. Um, so is it a KO? I, I, I don't know, is it just is it just something like this? But yeah, the reason I actually wanted to get this guy, I already had the Titans Return version. I saw a while ago, uh, Walkie um, swapped his um, windshields on his two because he preferred the dark windshield on this color scheme. Um, and because I'm a freak, uh, I prefer the opposite. I like the Hasbro color scheme, um, but I like the way that the insignia here like shows through this windshield. Um, it has like a proper like sculpted bit on there for it, whereas this one has it just sort of printed on top, and I, I don't like that as much. So let's just do a bit of toy surgery right now. <laughs> I will admit that right now, of these two, uh, the Legends version is definitely uh, looking much better. Uh, the Titans Return version is a little bit sourceless now, um, but I think with an insignia, this is going to look really good as well, so we'll see. Now, I'd seen that In Demand had crash bars going cheap, uh, but it wasn't until later in the day that I saw that Kapow also had scrap hooks, and I was like, by your powers combined, I could have the Junkions. These two are the most exciting uh, things come out of Legacy, I would say. They feel like the perfect like evolution of the Isa's uh, gimmick. Um, and yeah, I've already had great fun like putting them together, making these wacky combinations and stuff. I'll, I'll, I'll post, post a couple up, up here. Don't have too much to say about these Awise and they are brand new toys, so you've probably seen them. Let's move along to the next thing. Also from In Demand, they had it cheap, everyone was buying them, and it is still possibly the coolest item that I got this entire weekend. It's the Transformers the Movie Hot Rod in all of his wonderful pink G1, like tampographed glory like just look at this it's it's everything it's like flown right out of the screen and into my hands oh, pink, pink. this is my first ever uh, g1 reissue of any kind and it turns out there is something really special about having like an actual g1 toy but sort of new you know like as a kid would have unboxed this back in the 80s um and 
to have it in such a wonderful like paint scheme as well. Um, this is an incredible release and it honestly makes you wonder like why they didn't do this much sooner. And yeah, I might have to go in on a few more of these now. And as a result of just how much I've loved this, I've put in a cheeky pre-order for the Missing Link Optimus Prime in specifically the cartoon colors, right? Because again, if we're going for the sort of G1 toy, but in the cartoon color vibe, that is the equivalent release to, to this, right? So yeah, the idea is in my head, uh, I'm gonna get that got this and I'm going to try and get one of those vintage G1 uh, reissued bumblebees as well which has a very similar vibe uh, and I'll have like a you know G1 but in real uh, mini collection. So with, with ClubCon on the horizon uh, so we can get quick dinner and so it's Pizza Express which Daniel incredibly generously covered uh, so the next day I was like okay I need to I need to find you something um, and I got him a Human Alliance ice pick um, which turns out to be a, a great toy like kind of the, the you know last hurrah of the like uh, Revenge of the Fallen era scout class engineering. But yeah, then it was time for ClubCon, which is like always the highlight. The cosplay contest this year was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, there were a lot of great entries. It was like, you know, still very much the usual lineup of mostly uh, more than meets the eye characters plus like 500 star screams. Um, but nonetheless, just incredible work from those people. Just to quickly go over a couple of the standout acts. Firstly, this one star scream uh, at Inkfulu on Twitter uh, went up and did this incredible, very elaborate dance sequence uh, to the entirety of When I Rule the World. Um, and it was amazing, it did rule. The thing was that every time the music would reach the end of like a verse or whatever, you were like, okay, surely that's like the last insane move that's happening here. And then it would just keep going. It would just start like it would be a key change and it would just continue on. <laughs> um, and like the entire audience was was just basically spellbound for the whole thing, I feel. And there was a few of them like that where the performer was just like up there for, for ages. Uh, and like the whole sort of uh, schedule for the evening got delayed as a result. Um, and it turned out that what had happened was none of them had been drilled on the fact that the sound tech guys uh, were basically going to play the music until they walked off the stage. So they're all there waiting for the music to like, you know, start to fade out or them to, to cut it or whatever so that they leave um, and instead <laughs> they're just sort of up there like trapped in hell throwing shapes uh, for a song that just never ends. It's just really funny. The fact is they totally owned it so uh, incredible work to basically all the performers. My personal favourite cosplay of the weekend though was definitely the one person who dared to go to Transformers convention and cosplay as Wheelie. Like Sure, okay. She had an incredible outfit with like the visor and goggles and like a, an actual slingshot. So at the end of the contest, uh, you know, they'd been taking the photos and stuff and I'm making my way over and she's like going back to her seat. Uh, and the whole thing was just very awkward because I can't hear a fucking thing over the noise of the room. Uh, but I was basically like, you rule. Uh, please can I get a photo and also would you like one of these wheelie comics? After that it was a script reading which was written by usual TF Nation MC David Wallace. Um, and honestly, I've really missed script reading. It's because like it felt like after the trial of Megatron, they kind of went away. They did the big sort of uh, Transformers the movie panel instead last year. Um, and so, yeah, I guess they're, they're back now by popular demand, it seems. Um, and thank God. I think if you're gonna invite voice actors out to do all these panels and stuff, it really makes sense to just like get them together to like have a bit of fun as well, like during the big sort of Saturday show. Definitely one of the more tenuous scripts this year, I would say. I, I feel like half of the jokes were just aimed directly at more than meets the eye fans, which isn't to say they weren't funny, but like it, it's just like not relevant to the actual performers up there. Uh, <laughs> but still a pretty good time. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see who they bring along next year and, and what the, the script they end up going with is like. And that brings us to the point in the night that had the whole TF Wiki team like a buzz with anticipation, namely the Matrix test. Last year, Joe, Jala, uh, Jacob McBaggins from the TF Wiki Discord server, and myself uh, were there as the crack caliber laser blazer broadswords, um, and we won last year. Uh, and so this year, you know, we have to like defend the title, obviously. Um, but the thing is, with the guys from overseas as well, uh, plus Ben, there's now seven of us, uh, and we may slightly have absolutely demolished the competition. I, I say we, to be to be clear, uh, I did not answer a single question. I did not co contribute a single point to the team. I was there entirely for moral support. Not to say I didn't know stuff, you know, I, I know my stuff, but like these guys, they're just, they're so fast. And they're just like, all the all the, the tricky ones, somehow somehow they managed to plumb the depths of their minds and just and just retrieve it. So yeah, of the 35 points available in that quiz, our team got 33. The only questions we missed out on were one about the Marvel UK backup strips, which none of us really had a clue about, um, and one about uh, Hammerbite, Hammer Strike. We, we mixed them up, uh, and so 
whichever one we picked, it was it was the wrong one. I know Celia's, come on. Ugh. I think my favorite moment from the quiz uh, was when there was a question about like the early 2000s toy line packaging refresh subline things. So like Battle for the Spark, uh, Unicron Battles and Amada, um, the Power Links Battles and Energon, and then it's, what is it for Cybertron? Uh, and so none of us are like, no. And I just turned to Ben and I'm like, Ben? And he's like, Primus Unleashed. And I'm like, yes, mate. <laughs> But yeah, obviously we need to uh, work out something slightly different for next year. Well, the race not compete with fucking seven of us. Like, God, get it together. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can even the playing field a little bit. Now, it's weirdly become tradition for ClubCon to feature some kind of like performance art. Um, so like beginning with Stan Bush back in 2018, he had his big concert. Um, in 2019, Peter Spellos like had like his improv group there. And last year was Gary Chalk doing like an acoustic folksy set kind of thing. And this year, it was a concert by one-woman musical powerhouse, Jayhan, uh, who I had not heard of before this event, uh, but who rocks, as it turns out. She'd come all the way from Switzerland, and she played a shit ton of stuff from, like, the 1986 movie, uh, a lot of Linkin Park stuff, and, like, a lot of original stuff as well. And it was honestly awesome. Like, she was just on stage by herself uh, with a guitar, just rocking out and singing. Um, and it was like, wow, okay. Yeah, I was not expecting a cover of Iridescent by Linkin Park to fucking get me, but uh, here we are, I guess. After the concert, I'd arranged to meet up with Q Prime, who'd bought a couple of Kamen Rider figures from me. I've had sitting around for absolutely ages, and I, I, I do not know who they are, uh, and I did not want them, so I was very happy about that. And as it inevitably turns out to be on Saturday night at TF Nation, it was just a late one in the bar. Joe and I got to meet uh, our one, our worlds are in danger, uh, listener, fan. I, 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 don't, I don't feel good saying you're like, a fan of our podcast. You, you listen to it. Do you? Are you really a fan? But yeah, at Dust Schools on Twitter, uh, they're absolutely lovely. We met briefly, like, last year, I think, but this was the first time actually probably sitting down and have a chat, and yeah, just a good time. And later on Saturday as well was when I got to catch up with uh, James, that's at AutoFots on Twitter, um, who I met for the first time properly, I would say, at the Minicon uh, earlier this year. Uh, and the problem, as it turns out, with James is that whenever we get to talking, uh, that's it. We will just talk all night. Um, like, they just have so much interesting uh, stuff to say about, like, fan culture and uh, the IDW comics in particular um and yeah so it, it eventually did have to just call it a night it was like, okay i i'm physically too tired to stay up any longer and that just leaves us to do it all again the next day now overnight i clocked that by this point i'd inadvertently wound up with like a large chunk of the cast of the transformers the movie like all from different toy lines uh, and so as luck would have it uh when i walk into the dealer room the very first thing i see on the sunday is a titanium series scourge huh this is a toy that I feel like most people don't know exists. It's not one of the more like well-known uh, Titanium series designs. It's not based on any particular show. It's entirely just its own thing. Um, and the thing is, I think it's just good is probably why people don't remember it. It's like a fine toy. I am Titanium! It does have quite strange like leg joints, I will say. Like it's attached up into the top of the waist. Um, so you can sort of split them out or you can rotate them to bring them forward. Um, but still it's a really simple transformation i think he looks pretty good like the head sculpt obviously isn't isn't great but um still it's a really interesting artifact of that era of of toys i think you know long before generation scourge came along um like this would have been basically people's classic scourge also from toy Fu, right at the start of the day i noticed someone putting out like a stack of dvds uh, and so i went through and I, I simply had to get this now you're probably wondering why would you get this uh, DVD box set of the G1 cartoon in, in like notoriously not quite right broadcast quality or whatever? Well, for the answer to that, uh, stay tuned. You'll find out a little later on. And then it was the joint uh, May Cat and James Roberts like writers panel, uh, which is kind of funny because they haven't like worked together on anything. James Roberts very much just did the one thing, uh, whereas May is doing entirely different types of work. Uh, obviously, like riffing a lot on stuff that James did, but it's not really like a direct connection, I'll say. Um, but it was really interesting then to hear about their sort of different uh, experiences working with Hasbro, uh, where James Roberts was like, "Oh yeah, no, it was it was fine. I can I can just like stick a gay kiss and uh, more meets the eye, and it was it was cool. That was that was all right." Um, and maybe like, "Yeah, it's it's not like that for me." <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah you gotta wonder why that is like is it just that like obviously it's been like 10 years now at this point like is it just that the people at hasbro have like shifted and moved is it like the landscape of pop culture has, has somehow changed in a way that's made it worse or maybe it's just that they don't give a shit about comics but like when it's a big cartoon that's gonna be on streaming services and on the fucking bbc uh like they're just sort of oh no don't don't do anything too shocking 
there's no way knowing, I guess, from the outside. We'll maybe find out at some point in the future. But yeah, still just interesting to think about. Back in the dealer room, I spotted one of the few things that I'd like really set my mind on keeping an eye out for. Um, so there was this one stand uh, that had tons and tons of like older sealed like stuff, a lot of like movie product. It was very much like a father son affair. So like, uh, you know, they're both just running this sort of stand, both sides of it. Um, and I overheard at one point in the convention that some motherfucker uh, stole 200 pounds in cash from that stall uh, from this kid and his dad. Um, which is genuinely, it just makes my blood boil um, that someone would like do that at a place like TF Nation. Similarly, I think more art gallery who do like those really like high quality sort of art prints of like G1 characters and stuff, uh, they had all their poster stock apparently stolen before the convention. Um, I, I, what, like, what are you going to do with those fucking posters? <laughs> like, who's going to buy them uh, for anything, like, close to the amount of money that would make that worthwhile? Uh, it's such a dick move. But yes, yeah, so I'm walking past this stand, uh, and, you know, I, I don't want to buy anything sealed. Uh, it's not really my vibe. But, like, I, because I am after this one thing, I do take a look. Uh, and they have it. They have Movie Elita 1, um, the little Energon Redeco uh, motorcycle uh, with all the sort of more realistic coloured Omnicons they did from that line. Just check this out. This is just such an amazing toy, uh, and I would say it's, it's kind of like all things to all people. Um, like, on the face of it, I would say this is like the Transformers the movie RC, but as created in a time when you, you can't make a pink toy, right, so it has to be red. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's the right colour layout, I would say, for the character on a mould designed as that character. Aside from that, you can imagine it as like a Unicron trilogy, Omnicon variation of, of some kind. Um, it's obviously the actual movie character, Elita One, uh, as featured in the Titan magazines and stuff. Um, and it's also Shattered Glass RC, I believe, um, as featured in the pro stories, etc. Um, but, but most importantly for me, I feel like spiritually this looks uh, as close as you can get. Uh, to Rise of the Beasts RC, um, mostly because she has these two wheels on her back from the final movie design, um, which her core class studio series figure actually lacks. Um, so for me, this is just much more like the vibe of the character. Um, I would say it's kind of the perfect RC toy, uh, even though it's not RC. <laughs> But yeah, she definitely cost a little bit more than I was willing to pay for a, you know, just like a little scout. Uh, like, it's the problem with buying something sealed. Uh, but again, you know, it's a vibe operation, and uh, they were so chill, I was able to make them an offer on that and a little Studio Series wheelie, um, who, I will be honest, uh, this guy is just atrocious. Like, most of the problems are definitely, I would say, in this vehicle mode. The whole thing is so square. You've got the fists, like, just hanging out back here. The windshield just can't even, like, look forward. Um, it... Uh, None of this is right, it just does not look like Wheelie's vehicle mode. Stupid Cupid! Hey, hey, set me free! Stupid Cupid, stop picking on me! So yeah, his transformation, I would say, is way less fun than the Titans Return one. Like, yeah, it does technically hold together a little bit better, but it's just, the moves aren't as clever. And then look at him here, you got all this stuff like just hanging out on the back. Um, nothing is formed up correctly. He has like hinges all over him. Um, I'm just, I'm just not into it. Um, he does have the slingshot to be fair. Uh, and the head sculpt is really nice. Um, but eh, it's, it's a, it's a nice little wheelie, uh, but at the same time it is the worst wheelie. What was funny is they had him just like floating around in like a box of bits. Uh, when I took him out, I was like, oh, you know, how, how much for this? And, and he was like, oh, is that, that's like the, the third party uh, wheelie add-on for the Studio Series Grimlock. And I'm like, no, no, it's not. It's just, that's just the Studio Series one. You've got to uh, like, uh, <laughs> you just didn't did actually know what the thing was. And I, and I had to be like, yeah, no, they, they made a transforming one as, as well. Uh, people just forgot, I guess. But yeah, no, so those guys are really cool. Um, they're called Bears Toy Cave. Um, I think they're starting up like an actual shop, uh, physically speaking. Um, so definitely check them out on Facebook if you can. Back at the Toy Food, I found what was probably the most surprising find of the weekend. Um, so they had sealed a Takara Adventure uh, Jazz and Deadlock. Uh, so this was like the two pack they did of these two characters. Uh, this canonically is, I think, IDW Drift who like crossed universes or, or something or other. Um, point is, 
I got it because specifically this toy for me uh, is like spiritually, I guess, the closest you can get to a toy of more than meets the eye drift. Um, he looks very different from the original like generations design he was given. This guy's getting totally washed out against the background. <laughs> But yeah, just doesn't he look great? Like, he's got a little sword that can just go in there. Uh, the head sculpt is, like, perfect. Um, yeah, I think it's wonderful. As for Jazz... Jazz... And all that jazz... This is definitely, like I would say, the most radical redesign of uh, Generation 1 Jazz while still keeping the sort of same vibe. Um, and, yeah, he looks great. I love, like, the shoulders and this big, like, bonnet on the chest. Um, the only problem with these two toys is unfortunately that they're, they're both just crap. These are like terrible like toys to actually like transform and just handle. Uh, everything about them feels cheap and just, ah, uh, it's it's grim. Even the paintwork is just so blotchy in places like, yeah, you can't see on this camera. Um, but um, definitely a case of, I got this set for, for one character um, and I have two toys, uh, which are not so good at being toys as they are as being like, whoa, something that looks really cool. Still, this was definitely actually like the biggest bargain of the convention because the whole set, like boxed new, was £20. Um, I think that's kind of what's cool about Toy Fu, um, is that they will have different people pricing the stuff up, and so some stuff is going to be more expensive, and some stuff is going to be cheaper. And so if you're someone who goes up to the store and you're wanting like a particular toy, a particular character, you've got to have it, and it's like, that's cool, you know, you can, you're happy to pay that. But if you're more in like my position where you're just looking out for stuff that's affordable, they will still have like things where you go, oh yes, actually that. Um, and then that will keep you coming back to the store, you know, and ultimately everyone's happy, I feel. Um, so I think that's, yeah, something really good about Toy Fu. And so by this point on the Sunday, uh, people are definitely like starting to head out, you know, it's going to the end of the weekend. Um, and at one point Viv was like leaving and I had to run to the dealer hall to grab Daniel, who at that point was queuing up to see Nick Roche. Um, and I was like, we need to take a photo just now of like the Aspect of Prime crew because there's so many of us here. Um, and <laughs> so we're just like pegging out of the uh, dealer hall and we just hear a voice behind us from the merch desk like, don't run. Uh, and we're like... <laughs> So yeah, we, we did get the photo of them after I went back and was like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, we, we should have done that. And, and they were like, yeah, it's it's like you're back in school, isn't it? You know, don't, don't run in the corridors. Um, but that was, that was fucking stupid. Like, just don't run in hotels. You will look like an idiot and probably die. I briefly saw a few uh, towards the end of Sunday uh, and he looked absolutely fucking knackered. Um, and I was still like, I was like, oh, hi, hi, few. Uh, and I got absolutely pied. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's that's fair. I genuinely would hate to be in his position, just coming back like year after year with his league of like parasocial fans. Uh, and I, I, I feel like one of them. Like we we have talked, but like you know, a lot of people have talked. So I hope he manages to work something out next year. I think very much he just needs to probably get like a table and formalize the whole thing a little bit. Or maybe he can just like secretly put together like an entire like mech cosplay, you know, and just go in the full cardboard getup and so no one can see that it's him. So yeah, the end of the day is drawing in and I still have not talked to any of the guests. Uh, so I'm like, okay, time to go and do all of that just now. Um, and first of all, um, last year I managed to get my copies of uh, The End of the Road and Regeneration 1. Uh, so like the, the sort of, you know, bridging point, the end of the Marvel series, the start of the continuation. Um, like I got them signed by uh, Simon Furman and Andrew Wildman and various other people. Um, but one notable absence last year was Stephen Baskerville, who um, did all the inking and stuff. He does all these like really detailed um, panels. Um, and you can see in here as well. Um, so yeah, I was like, I will just like go over and ask for signatures. You know, I don't, I don't know too much about this guy. I don't want to take up too much of his time. Uh, you know, he ultimately like, like drew comics that came out before I was born. Uh, I'm not sure there's gonna be anything to say, um, but nonetheless, you know, it was good, like, okay, I'll go say hi. And as he's there signing these things, he asked me, are you an artist? And I'm like, no, no, I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not more, more of a writer, um, but like, oh, my, my brother's an artist, and then I you know, thought, oh, I can show him the Wheelie comic, which we made last year, um, and he takes a huge interest in it. He's like, 
just really like quite taken with this little tiny uh, comic, um, and um, yeah, he was like, "Oh, I might have to steal this idea to make to make business cards." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, do it." Um, so yeah, he asked me like, "Do you do you want to write for the Transformers? You know, like um, like actually do proper comics and stuff?" And I was like, "Yeah, I think I think everyone in this room <laughs> would like would love to do that." Um, but yeah, it was a very nice chat. I, I let him uh, obviously keep a copy of the the comic, and yeah, later on, I'm walking around the room uh, and I'm sort of passing by his table, and he like flags me down. Uh, and he's like, would you like this? And he like goes through the stuff on his table uh, and he picks out this, which is, oh my God. Uh, I was like, I cannot <laughs> take this. Like, uh, absolutely not. You know, there's, there's an actual original piece of artwork. Um, you know, it it still has like tip X on it for God's sake. But he's like, no, absolutely. You know, I've had this for a few conventions and it hasn't sold and, and you know, it's, it's yours if you want it. And I was like, well, absolutely. Yeah, oh my God. So yeah, as soon as I got home, I found a frame for it, uh, and it's so cool. I'm gonna absolutely like have to call this up at some point. Um, just what an insane gesture! I think this is absolutely like the coolest thing that I left the convention with. Like, there's just no way I could have imagined. Uh, I, I mean, for me, ultimately, when I'm when I'm there, unfortunately, um, as much as I, I like like artwork and stuff, given the choice between artwork and like picking up toys and stuff, I end up always going for the latter, um, and so having someone say, here, like, have this, like, um, it just, it meant a lot. Um, and so, yeah, very cool. I feel like every year I end up taking something different for James Roberts to sign, uh, and this year I, I wanted to just get something that, I feel like no one's asked him to sign, uh, which is Starcadia Quest, the, <laughs> like, one comic he's ever done professionally outside of Transformers. Um, like, it came out after the end of Lost Light, uh, apparently nobody read it. Um, I don't know. Um, he was like, "Oh yeah, that that was a that was a good bit of fun." Um, like he seemed to have like no like ill will or, or anything towards this comic. I was just hoping he would say something about like w how the fuck this came about uh, and why it just sort of immediately like vanished into obscurity. Um, and but he was just like, "Oh yeah, that was cool." Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> sure, I guess. I spoke to May Cat. Uh, now, obviously, they're a TV writer, so I didn't have anything for them to sign. Um, but I wanted to say like thanks for an interview that they did with the TF Wiki community blog, like a, a few years ago now. Um, but it was like really cool at the time. Um, definitely check that out if you haven't read it. And obviously, I also wanted to say just how like much I've enjoyed their writing for like basically the last three Transformers shows that have come out. And I was I was so sure I was gonna like mom spaghetti this interaction because. The thing is, there's no way to like word what I wanted to say without like seriously slagging off like a lot of their colleagues. Um, but I, I was basically like, um, yeah, every time one of these new shows comes out, like we sit down and watch it, and I can always tell the minute you know, it's, it's a May Cat script. And I said how when we watched War for Cybertron Kingdom, like in a group on Discord, we were like, oh my god, oh what the hell, this is this is this first episode is it's actually good. And then the second episode starts that we're all like, and when I say this, May's wife is like sitting next to them uh, and has just taken like a big sip of drink and just barely manages not to do like a spit take. Um, and it's like, okay, <laughs> I guess there's some tea here maybe. So at this point, there's half an hour left, I would say, in the dealer hall. Uh, I finally spot the person I've been on the lookout for all weekend. Um, in fact, the, the very reason why I bought this, this DVD box set, um, because it's the one, the only, Darren Jamieson. So I go over and I'm like, I'm sorry, are you Darren Jamieson? Uh, and he looks at me and he goes, what have I done? Uh, and I'm like, I'm sorry, it, it was 20 years ago uh, and I produce a copy of The Beast Within. Uh, and I say, could you sign this for me, please? I'm sure if you're watching this, you know uh, what the deal with this comic is, so I won't relitigate it here. Um, but basically, he'd been there like with his family like the whole weekend. He's just there as an attendee. Uh, and they're like also just sort of hanging out there. They're, they're like watching this interaction happen. They're just very bemused by the whole thing. Which like you would be right if like your dad like got approached by some stranger over some comic he made 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> So I'd seen them all at ClubCon the night before. They were like sitting a few rows behind us and I kept like turning around like, is that, is that who I think it is? Because he was wearing like, because uh, on the Saturday he was wearing a presumably like a self-printed t-shirt of the Beast Within. But yeah, I guess, I guess they clocked that because one of them was like, oh, were you, were you in front of us at ClubCon? And I was like, yeah, shit, yeah. Um, I think the, the most insane thing I found out from them was that at one point they tried to like find a copy of the Beast Within online uh, and all they got was my shitty, like, re-lettered fan edit of it, um, which is honestly terrifying to think about. I am so sorry. So yeah, if you're thinking this entire social interaction sounds like a complete train wreck, um, it was, but I, I, th I think I more or less managed to save it, uh, and all I'll say is, 
stay tuned. Maybe this won't be the last you hear about this whole thing. Or, or maybe it will be. There's no way not. The last guest I wanted to see this year was Steve White, uh, who was honestly, like, probably the best colorist um, on the old, like, Marvel UK stuff. And definitely one of the best colorists in, like, Transformers generally, I would say. Um, like, really, like, pioneering stuff with, like, digital color separation and all that. For me, he's mostly notable because he colored the, I think, annual 1989 uh, story piece, um, which stars Triton, which I relettered into uh, Pass. Um, sadly, I did not have a copy of my shitty edits to give him. Um, I think I've given out all the, the previous copies I made like over, over previous conventions. So that was a shame. Uh, but I did notice that he had a binder of Magic the Gathering cards. And I had no idea that he worked on Magic the Gathering. But it turns out that he's like an actual proper like uh, sort of nature fantasy illustrator. Um, and so he worked on like a lot of the old ones um, doing like sort of big green creatures, animal type things. So I'm looking for his little binder and I'm looking at all the cards like, ah, yeah, these are all like fairly old cards. None of them are like mechanically powerful or good or anything. Um, so I just asked like, hey, you know, um, of all these, like, what is the artwork you most like of all these cards? Uh, and he points out to me Rogue Elephant, um, this card right here. Plot focus, there we go. And he signed it for me, so check it out. It's it's a pretty, pretty actually solid card, I would say. Quite cool. So yeah, I was definitely not expecting to leave TF Nation with a Magic the Gathering card. Um, and I was also really surprised that when I got home, um, I met with a friend and I was helping him put together, like, a deck. Uh, I would go through his cards and he had a copy. And I was like, oh we've got to put that in there, we've got to use this card. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting to have that interaction and then and see the card in the wild. But yeah, from there, that's basically the end of the actual event. Um, you know, it's just the Q&A and the closing ceremony. Um, so we all make our way over. And thankfully this year, the questions were all like normal and polite, but I will say we did end up sitting next to one guy. I, I think only I noticed this, um, this one fucking asshole. So like elsewhere in the audience, there's this other guy who gets the microphone and he starts telling this like fairly personal story um, for like basically just to provide some context for something that his, his kid's about to say. Um, and it's basically just, you know, explaining what the circumstances of his life are, like coming to the, the convention. Um, and uh, this fucking asshole next to me, uh, it just like, or, like the minute this, this like starts, he like audibly like makes like a uh, like this, uh, and then like as, as it continues, he just goes like, "Oh, we didn't ask for your life story, mate." Uh, and I'm like, "Mate, shut the fuck up!" <laughs> like, generally, I just don't understand what some people's malfunction is. Um, like, yeah, okay, fine, this guy is like taking up like a bit of time on the microphone, uh, but it's clearly like something personal that I think everyone can like resonate with, or like I guess not if you're just like a fucking asshole, but. Uh, anyway, but yeah, the only reason I bring this up at all is because he was the only guy in the entire weekend uh, where I was like, oh my god, I, I do not want to talk to you. I was like, you seem like a fucking asshole. Um, like, everyone else was so nice and just chill. In my, like, personal experience, my interactions, uh, it was all good. Actually, tell a lie, I remember we were at breakfast uh, one morning and uh, we're there, like, in the queue, you know, getting, getting the food and stuff, and someone who's, like, clearly already been through the queue, like, comes over and is like, oh, can I just, can I just get into the, the fridge that's next to you, you know, like, it's, it's you know, just to, to grab something or whatever, and and the guy behind me, it just says, like, oh, you know, it's, you know, it's a, there's a queue, mate, like, you, you, and it's like, mate, just, it's, this isn't going to hold the queue, they just want to, they just want to grab a bit of food, like, it's, it's fine, just fucking chillax, you know, um, so I was, I was unimpressed with that. And after that, it's basically just like back to the bar. So Daniel, uh, Loco and I have received this like hot tip, I guess, that there's like a secret bar. Um, if you just take a corridor down from the main one past the swimming pool, uh, then you come to this other one. And it's like, there's less of a queue there, so you can just buy your drink and then go back to the main bar. And that was the plan. Um, but as it turned out, it was just as busy there. Uh, and it was with like a, just a very different crowd, the Transformers crowd, because it turns out that the Greece secret cinema is happening at the NEC. Um, and so there's all these people there dressed in the style of of Greece, I, I don't know, I, I haven't seen that movie, I don't know what it is. But So yeah, we were basically queuing up to get drinks uh, and two women come over and just start hitting on us. Uh, and we're like, okay, sure, I guess, is that what's happening here? Afterwards, Loka was like, they, they were hitting on us, right? Uh, and I was like, yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I, I don't, cause like, you're, you're totally just barking up the wrong tree. Like we're, we're all there in our like graphic t-shirts, uh, just like, <laughs> But very funny if so. Uh, but yeah, either way, it was it was just a nice conversation because like they had no idea the Transformers convention was going on, uh, and they were just like quite interested in the whole thing. Um, so yeah, it was a similar vibes to like the salsa dancers that we've had like in previous TF Nations. Uh, I think they were meant to be there this year as well, but like I, I guess the event uh, got cancelled is what is what I heard. Um, and if that is like the the last time now, and then maybe that's the end of an era, I guess. You know, it feels like it's such a fixture of the convention. So. Um, don't know if they'll be back next year, we'll see. 
But yeah, we did eventually secure drinks, uh, made our way back to the main bar, and ended up hanging out with uh, James, Lily, and Liam. Uh, again, I think I've met all of them in like previous years, uh, but this is the first time like, actually hanging out. Lily had a yellow alternator's tracks, uh, and also a Generations drink keep, uh, and was just having like a great deal of difficulty transforming both of them, which like fucking fair. Those are insane figures. Um, but so, yeah, we were just like trying to like work out how do you how do you fit this together? Like like how is this supposed to go? Getting it into an actual like properly folded up vehicle mode. Also, it's just fucking weird. It's, that's like the one thing from that era which I I don't I. I don't really have an interest in it. I, I'm interested, in it, but I, I don't. I don't want to own either in my house. Meanwhile, Liam had bought five fucking mix masters uh, and a bone crusher just for spice, I guess. Uh, so we ended up making like this. Uh, whoops! All mix masters uh, devastator, uh, which was just fucked, I guess. So yeah, suffice to say, kind of a great night. Um, and the next day, Monday, nothing much happened. Uh, it was very much just a chill one, waiting for people to leave. I must have walked back and forth from the train station like three times, I would say, just just sort of seeing people away. Um, and eventually, yeah, it was my turn, and off I went, and now here we are. But yeah, as I said at the start, this year genuinely could not have gone better for me, I would say. Uh, definitely like the best TF Nation yet in my book. It was just incredible, like catching up with so many people uh, and meeting so many people for the first time. And there's a lot of people that I wish I could have spent more time chatting with, um, but it's always just like, oh, you know, I'll catch you later. Uh, and then you don't see them until it's Monday morning and they're about to leave. Uh, <laughs> so if you're one of those people, uh, I'm sorry, I'll see you next time, right? But yeah, if you've watched all the way to the end of this video, uh, thank you so much. I, I don't know why you've, you've done that, but I hope you've enjoyed it anyway. Um, and feel free to hit me up on the bot talk forums. Let's do it all again next year, yeah?